Humor. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Suzanne Massey will be here on Monday uh, afternoon at 4 o'clock uh, to talk about her book. So I invite you all to join us at 4 on Monday. And then Tuesday at 10 o'clock, we have uh, our uh, uh, alumni uh, or our uh, advisory council member, Larissa Dariglazova uh, from Tomsk State University, uh, will be here for a presentation on her book at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. And then, uh, of course, for anybody who doesn't already know, Tuesday evening is our 40th anniversary dinner at which we'll be honoring Gene Lawson and Paul Rodzienko, both longtime uh, soldiers in the trenches of U.S.-Russia relations. Uh, and then Wednesday next week uh, at 3.30, we will have a presentation by another of our advisory council members, uh, this time from Kiev, Natalia Musienko. Uh, we'll talk about art and the Euromaidan protest movement. So that's for the housekeeping. Uh, Ken is going to talk today about his book, Reagan at Reykjavik, which um, I have to say, uh, I agree with you, Ken. It's definitely uh, written in a, uh, in a novellic style, if that's even a word, but it's certainly um, uh, maybe, maybe given the setting, a uh, style of a saga. Um, <laughs> but uh, it certainly is uh, somewhat surreal to read this on a sultry uh, spring afternoon in the mid-Atlantic of the United States and imagine uh, the, the kind of thinking that was going on on a cold, uh, cold uh, weekend or a couple of days in, uh, in Iceland. Um, but certainly the, the impact, I think you you argue quite persuasively of these couple of days is, is incomparable, and so it's worth being discussed. Um, but certainly in any case, Ken Edelman is worth listening to. He was arms control director for President Reagan uh, and accompanied him in that capacity. I learned from your book on the chase plane, uh, mm -hmm. though I imagine sometimes you got to ride on the main plane. I want to hear about that. Um, to uh, to uh, the historic summit at Reykjavik, uh, but also to three superpower summits with the former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, he served as assistant to the Secretary of Defense in the 1970s, as well as to the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Uh, and U.S. Arms Control Director in the 1980s. Uh, he's been a member of various uh, prominent advisory commissions, uh, the recipient of a number of high-level awards for his service in government. Uh, he's also a widely published analyst uh, and writer on uh, a great many subjects ranging from international security and international affairs to Shakespeare, um, which I think begs a question that perhaps I should save for later, and that's um, which Shakespeare characters do these two <laughs> most resemble? We can discuss. Uh, he's taught at Johns Hopkins University, Georgetown University, and George Washington University, uh, and with his wife, they teach executive leadership through the works of William Shakespeare and their firm, Movers and Shakespeare's. Not afraid of a good pun, I give you Ken Edelman. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. That was wonderful. Uh, Matt didn't mention that uh, I had uh, written before Reagan at Reykjavik. Yeah, thank you. I had written um, five other books. And uh, someone once said, that the most valuable copy of one of my previous books is an unsigned copy. There are virtually no unsigned copies. And an unsigned copy with a receipt that someone paid for it is in the rare book selection of that. But uh, I think that uh, Reagan and Reykjavik will be different because uh, it is written like a novel. It's based on very solid research. It ha it's a wonderful, wonderful story. I think three things make it unique. Number one is, it's a wonderful story. It's like an Agatha Christie mystery. That on a stormy weekend in October, with rain lashing against the windowsill, in <clears throat> an old creaky house in the middle of nowhere, on Iceland in a peninsula, um, two characters, are discussing and experiencing the most amazing thing in a house that was thought to be haunted with ghosts. And so it has the elements of that. Secondly are the two characters. Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev are two of the most interesting and charismatic and uh, complicated characters of the 20th century. And thirdly, the consequences. As Matt says, I believe that, and I make the case, that what happened at Reykjavik uh, led to the end of the Cold War, and I'm going to present that. I will show you a few uh, slides and have a little movie uh, 
segments for you, and then Matt and I will open it up to questions or uh, you know comments from that. But <clears throat> to run through, uh, the Reykjavik summit was the, actually the second summit with Gorbachev and Reagan. The first one was the year before, and it was a carefully scripted summit that had spent, we had spent uh, six months getting ready for the summit. What happened most amazing was the first few minutes of the summit, where Ronald Reagan, one generation older than Gorbachev, uh, was talking with us, a number of us, in this house, chateau actually, of the Aga Khan. We had spent six months working out that the summit would be in a neutral country, Switzerland, in a neutral city, Geneva, even in a neutral place, the Aga Khan's palace. Reagan is there and we're talking in the hallway and a Secret Service guy comes up and says, Mr. President, uh, Gorbachev's limo is coming around the corner. Reagan heads out to greet him, makes an indication like, welcome to my house and uh, I'm glad to have you in the uh, European White House here. And then Gorbachev goes up the stairs and while he is going up the stairs, the most amazing stage stagecraft happens where Ronald Reagan puts his arm under Gorbachev to help him up in case he needs a little help. And you can see that. And here is uh, then Chief of Staff of the White House, Don Regan, to recall the moment and the reaction of the Soviets to that moment. We are waiting for General Secretary Gorbachev to arrive. President Reagan uh, was waiting inside the mansion. He had no coat on. Uh, he was asked, did he want to put a coat on? And while he was trying to make up his mind, the Secret Service announced that Gorbachev was there. So Reagan said, my heavens. He raced out the door without his overcoat, down the steps, and just... Okay. There we are. Well, I'm not going to be any good with this. <laughs> Okay, let's hope that's right. Help. Yes. <laughs> Let me just tell you after you get this, if you could just get this going again. Yeah. What was it? Oh, okay. All right, he found the, our, the source of the problem right here. But uh, it was, uh, like I say, carefully set up on this. And uh, the expectations were before Reykjavik, and we had intelligence. We had intelligence from the CIA. We had intelligence from our ambassador in Moscow. We had intelligence from their ambassador in Washington, okay? And all of them agreed that this was going to be a grip and grin kind of summit. This was going to be a uh, photo op summit, that Gorbachev needed this summit in order to increase his prestige in the Soviet Union because he wanted to undergo a number of reforms, and therefore we shouldn't expect much to happen. Okay? Uh, when Reagan made the announcement on the White House lawn before flying to Reykjavik, he said, basically, this isn't even a summit. This is just a meeting to prepare for a summit. So the expectations were very low. Uh, and uh, we thought we were just along for the ride. Uh, the American delegation, because Don Regan, Chief of Staff of the White House, we just saw uh, there, uh, was uh, always knocking people off the manifest, and it was kind of a small group uh, that was coming. With his hand out, ready to greet him. Good. Greet him. All right. Go back to, can you go back to, can you go back to the muffler, start of this? Hat, overcoat. For General Secretary Gorbachev right, to arrive, Thank President you. Reagan uh, was waiting inside the mansion. And up a little bit. He had no coat on. Uh, he was asked, did he want to put a coat on? And while he was trying to make up his mind, the Secret Service announced that Gorbachev was there. So Reagan said, my heavens. He raced out the door without his overcoat, down the steps, and just as Gorbachev's a limousine door opened, there was Reagan with his hand out, ready to greet him. Gorbachev was bundled up in a muffler, hat, overcoat. Reagan then put his hand under Gorbachev's arm and assisted him up the stairs. <laughs> I felt that uh, we lost the game. 
<laughs> during this first <laughs> m movement. You can compare it with a chess game. We started with the wrong move. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's from the Soviet, uh, <laughs> Soviet commentator on that. Like I told you, it was not going to be a summit. It was going to be a preparation for a summit. And this is the preparatory meeting. It was announced and uh, put together in about 12 days. All right. To remind you, we spent six months getting ready for the previous summit. This is in 12, 14 days. This is the preparatory meeting of the summit. These are all the American uh, representatives of various government agencies. These are the Soviet representative of government agencies. And back there were the uh, agencies from the um, Iceland government. This is a, a uh, cartoon, and I put a bunch of cartoons in this book. Uh, here is uh, Reagan saying, hi, Mike. I see you're all set for our low-key one-on-one non-summit. And you can see Gorbachev with reams. Actually, Gorbachev had 300 people with him on, for the delegation, and we probably have, I don't know, 25 at the most. This is the, believe it or not, the uh, Prime Minister of Iceland. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what his PR person was doing. Uh, he, Iceland is a country where not much happens, and none of it is very important, okay? And uh, so to get in 10 days' time descended on by the world community, including at the time of the summit opens, 3,217 journalists are accredited to the summit. Uh, the Tom Brokaw right here is uh, wanted an interview with the prime minister and said uh, when could they ask his assistant, when could the prime minister do it? And the prime minister's office said, anytime you can do it, when you have time is fine. And so they uh, arrived at a time where uh, the prime minister takes his daily dip in the thermal springs and uh, no one told him to you know, get a bathrobe or at least a towel on. <laughs> At this summit, uh, bro at this uh, interview, Brokaw asked him about the Hofti House, where it was announced that the meeting would take place. This is a Miss World, who had been crowned Miss World shortly before. She was called back from Singapore to greet and have press availability during the summit time. I thought this would make a great cover for my book and kind of entitle it, you know, Sex, Dieting, Cats, and Reagan at Reykjavik. But um, somehow the publisher thought that was a little off uh, the subject matter on this. But uh, she came back and uh, <coughs> to reign in Iceland during that time uh, to greet people. This is Raisa Gorbachev, Nancy Reagan stayed home because uh, she presumed that both of the first ladies were not going to be there. And everybody in the White House staff said that Mrs. Reagan, Mrs. Gorbachev would not be there. She was, um, let me put it delicately, none too happy when she found out that Raisa was there. Raisa was all too happy to uh, be there. And with a news blackout of the events of the summit itself, she had the world stage to herself, and boy, did she use it well. In uh, the first day of the summit, she changed outfits four times on the first day, which is a little robust, and uh, she went to something like eight tourist sites uh, at the, uh, in Reykjavik, which was, you know, about seven more than anybody else ever did in the history of uh, Iceland. She was fit to be, uh, she was really looking great, and uh, you'll see a few more slides of her. This, I love this, this is a great, great photo that I just came across when doing research of this. This is President Reagan wearing a uh, coat that he must have gotten from some movie set in the 30s. Um, and uh, what I found so strange about it was that he, I never saw him wear the coat again that weekend or any other time. And so I guess it was the one time he had it for this. Uh, he is there walking on the presidential grounds in Iceland, such that they be, with the president of Iceland, who was a um, woman who had run the city theater in Reykjavik before becoming president. She was the first elected president in the world. And she said the most wonderful thing during their walk. She said, you know, there's no school on how to teach you to be a president. 
So that I think the theater is the best thing to do because theater te teaches you about life, about relationships, about society, and uh, you can learn how to be a president from a theater. Ronald Reagan loved that idea, and ever since, ever after that time, whenever he saw her, he says, there's my old colleague. <laughs> this is the Hofty House where everything took place. It's in an isolated um, peninsula, and you can see the size of it. It's very small. Uh, it was uh, symmetrical. It's a beautiful, beautiful structure. It stands out because it's about the only wooden structure in Iceland, and it's thought to be haunted because the thermal springs underneath it keep changing temperature, and with a wooden structure, you know, it moves and creaks uh, with a uh, brick and uh, stone structure, which are all the other buildings, it holds firmer on this. So the British owned it for a while, and then they sold it because the British ambassador said they're, it's full of ghosts and full of spirits on that. During the time of the summit, we had this um, parlor right up here. The Russians had this parlor. The basement was awfully interesting. It was divided in half. The KGB had one half of the basement, and uh, the Secret Service and the CIA had the other half of the basement. This led to some problems because the basement had two bathrooms. One was much larger than the other. And in the uh, arrangements for the summit, uh, both sides wanted the larger bathroom. And finally, you know, they were going back and forth on this. The caretaker didn't know what to do. He was not used to negotiating between the nuclear superpowers, uh, especially about something so tender as uh, Lou writes to the Lou. And so um, he didn't know what to do. The head of the KGB said, oh, to hell with it. Uh, let's just go, you know, on the basis of whoever uh, needs the bathroom to do that. So um, basically, intelligence communities generally work on a need-to-know basis. The two main intelligence agencies in the world work on a need-to-know basis, but that weekend they worked on a need-to-go basis on that. <laughs> Here is um, a, uh, another cartoon. You, you know they say the house is haunted, the Hofty house. You want something spooky, check out next door, which of course is the arms race. This is Saturday morning where, uh, again, they meet right there, and they're meeting in a very small conference room uh, in the Hofty House. Uh, you can see it's a small table with, uh, here's Gorbachev and the President. Uh, there's Foreign Minister Shevardnadze, uh, Secretary of State Schultz. There's the Russian translator. There's the uh, American translator. These knees here are the uh, Russian note taker, and right over here is the American note taker. One of the wonderful things that I was so lucky to find in the story of Reykjavik when I did this, unknown to what I knew at the time during this weekend, was that uh, the notes had, were declassified. And so in these chapter four, five, and six of the book, what I did is strict kind of back and forth between Reagan and Gorbachev about the main issues of the day. And I don't know about you, but they were talking 10 and a half hours that weekend. And like I say, I don't know about you, but I never talked to anybody for 10 and a half hours that weekend. I think if I talked to my wife that much over a weekend, she'd walk out <laughs> screaming or anything. But the fact is that we have the notes, the Russian notes and the American notes pretty much agree on what happens, and it's stunning to read those notes, and it's stunning to see that contrary to the opinion that people had, there's no intellectual difference between the two, there's no knowledge difference between the two, uh, there's no vigor difference between the two. Ronald Reagan, if anybody finishes this book reading it, uh, the fact is that you can't come away with the idea that Ronald Reagan didn't know the issues and was out to lunch on some of these it, uh, matters. It just, you see the dialogue and you realize that it's quite, quite amazing. In fact, during the 10 and a half hours, Gorbachev, and I counted it, says 11 or 12, no, 11 or 12 times, Mr. President, I'm making all the concessions and you're giving me nothing. And you know what Reagan says to those 11 or 12 complaints? He says nothing. He sits there thinking, what's wrong with that? 
<laughs> I think it's fine by me, you know, and uh, I wouldn't want it any other way. And so Gorbachev is constantly harping on that. During the, after the first morning of this meeting right here, we were assembled in a bubble. Rick Burt back there knows bubbles from, and those of you who have served in the government know bubbles. They're in every embassy in the world. They're a secure room within a room that can't be bugged, basically, absolutely secure. In Reykjavik, they ordered the smallest bubble ever made because nothing secure ever happened there. Nothing ever happened there, but nothing secure ever happened there. And therefore, we're in this bubble, eight seats. They had folding chairs, the type that uh, Walmart would be ashamed to sell these days, or Kmart, just gray folding uh, metal seats. And we were kind of cramped in side by side, almost knee to knee in this uh, four on one side, four on the other. And the bubble has this big vault like a bank. And uh, all of a sudden, we're there, and Schultz is telling us a little about what's happening at the talks. And all of a sudden, the vault kind of opens up. One of these seven foot, eight inch you know, Secret Service guys says the President of the United States. We all stand up, and then we're belly to belly and shoulder to shoulder. And uh, Reagan looks at it and says, boy, they should just fill this up with water and put in some fish and have a great aquarium here. <laughs> And now we have a problem. And the problem is basically that there are nine of us in an eight-seater. And uh, the Secretary of State is there. He's not going anywhere. The National Security Advisor is in there. He's not going anywhere. And um, well, I'm not insignificant. I was not on the top of the uh, food chain at that time. So I thought real fast, and I decided if I was going to stay in, and I did know that by God I was going to stay in, that I better hit the ground fast. So as everybody is there, I say, Mr. President, please take my seat. And I hit the ground, and for the next 40 minutes or so, I lean gently against the presidential knees and, uh, while we're talking in the bubble. There was a documentary, oh, kind of a reenactment of Reykjavik done the year after, done in 1987, or the beginning of 88, by Anglican TV in Britain. And they have that scene, I'll show you right now. Gorbachev surprised the world when he proposed a preparatory summit meeting at Reykjavik with Ronald Reagan. Their talks launched the superpowers on a new path towards the first agreements ever to cut their stockpiles of nuclear weapons. What follows is a dramatization of the inside story of Reykjavik. All right, let's get into the bubble. human rights well he spent the whole morning on arms control I, I should respond on that mr. president if you start with human rights for sure you're gonna end up with arms control but if you start on arms control you're gonna stay on arms control so human rights will get squeezed out mm -hmm. thanks Ken George we can't have just one working party we want uh, a second group on, uh, on the other things, uh, human rights, Afghanistan, bilateral issues. Uh, someone told me that that was kind of the high point of that actor's career. Uh, which <laughs> you have to feel really sorry for him. If that, but that's not the only movie. There's a movie in the works uh, for this uh, on Reykjavik. Uh, Christoph Waltz is going to play Gorbachev. And uh, Michael Douglas is going to play Reagan. In fact, uh, Two weeks ago, I was at a diner with my wife, and all of a sudden the phone rang, and it's Michael Douglas. And he said, I'm two-thirds through with this book, and it is a great, great story. I am. And he was very excited about, um, about playing Reagan. He told me he was the only person he thought 
that could go from Liberace to Reagan, and I agreed that it probably was. And he asked me all kinds of questions, and I asked him all kinds of questions, and he has time in October, November, December to uh, do the shooting. Uh, Ridley Scott is the overall producer, and uh, he is really a great, great producer and great director. And uh, they asked me to be assistant, no, executive producer, and I explained to him that if executive producer means that I know how to make a film, I have no idea how to make a film. Uh, you know, I hardly know how to watch a movie, to tell you the truth. I don't see all that many. And, uh, but if executive producer is just a title, then I'm your man. And they said, no, no, it's just a title. And they were very, very happy that uh, I wasn't going to do anything but have that uh, great title. So that'll be in the works later. This is uh, a lunch at uh, the uh, American Ambassador's residence. It was kind of sad because, like I said, this, this was a come-as-you-are summit. And um, when it was announced, by the time it was announced, that uh, the ambassador was told when it was publicly announced and had no heads up like the Secret Service had and like the KGB had. They had two days. They went and they basically rented or reserved all the rooms that were available in Reykjavik, of which there are not that many. And so by the time the ambassador, uh, Nick Rui, a very nice man, was told by the Secret Service, the good news is, Mr. Ambassador, that the president will be staying in your residence, which delighted him, no doubt. Uh, the bad news is you won't be. Uh, so by the time they told him that, there was no room in town for him, and it was kind of sad because the only thing that happened in U.S.-Iceland relations uh, over the years uh, happened this weekend, and the U.S. ambassador uh, was not in town. He had just left for places unknown on that. <laughs> this is uh, Poindexter and Schultz are getting ready for some uh, papers to present at lunch. Uh, Reagan is there. This is, I think, lunch the first day, not the second day. There's Max Campbellman, who we just lost uh, last year, and Don Regan, chief of staff, myself, and uh, <coughs> the ambassador not at his place. Uh, Raisa Gorbachev, I told you, was running around town like mad with a her extreme uh, press entourage because it was the only game in town. Nothing else was happening. Uh, she went, as I said, to every place that would ever conceivably be a tourist attraction, including the Thermal Springs right there, and uh, greeting uh, women in uh, bikinis and guys, and uh, just f f trying to find somewhere else to go. This, during the talks themselves, both sides agreed to an extent, a great extent, on the reduction of existing nuclear weapons. They disagreed on the SDI, the Star Wars program, okay? And both of them, as they talked over the weekend, kind of jacked themselves up, with Reagan saying it was absolutely magnificent, even though it was a little uh, research program that, you know, of dubious uh, possibilities in the future. And, but Reagan talked about it like it was really going to save the world, and Gorbachev bought it. He just thought that it was the most threatening thing he'd ever heard in his life. This is a great Jeff McNally, a friend of ours, uh, so I really wanted to put him in the book, to tell you the truth. Uh, and he left us about five years ago of cancer. But I love this. Uh, Gorbachev is there with Reagan. And anyway, we don't think such a crazy thing would ever work. You got a light? Sure, says Reagan. He signals to SDI, boom, to get <laughs> lights a cigarette. And he says, this Star Wars stuff drives him nuts. And I love Reagan's little drawing right there of uh, that. This is Saturday night in Reykjavik. It was partly protest movement, partly street festival. Um, Joan Baez was there for a uh, personal and in-person concert. And while that was going on, uh, Gorbachev and Reagan agreed that the experts would meet that night at the Hofti House. <clears throat> so we traipsed over to the Hofti House at 8 o'clock. It was even more beautiful at night than it was before. We were in the Hofti House at 8 o'clock. We took a break at 3.15 in the morning, and we finished at 6.20 in the morning. On, our, on the Soviet side, leading their delegation was a man called Sergei Akramayev, who was a five-star marshal, the most decorated man in Soviet history. He had won the award of the Hero of the Soviet Union. 
And our last five-star general was Omar Bradley. And this was a man of tremendous, tremendous accomplishment. And the storyline through the book, uh, Reagan at Reykjavik, of Agrameoff, I think is one of the most wonderful parts of the storyline because he appeared all of a sudden, Saturday night, we did not know he was in town, we did not know, all of us knew his name, none of us had ever met him. He appears there and he sits and starts at 8 o'clock and Karpov, who Rick knows very well, and Arbatov and all these Fallon are there and their usual mode is to harangue and harangue and harangue about, you know, the U.S. position. This started about 8.02 in the negotiations. Akramayov put his hand, I think, on Karpov's arm, just looked at him. Karpov kind of sputtered around for a little bit. Then Akramayov looked at us and says, where were we before the interruption? And two or three more times that night, one of these guys would do their usual routine and Karpov, would, I mean, and uh, Akramayev would give them a five-star stare to shut them up because he wanted to get things done. During the, after the break that night, uh, the Soviets agreed to equal levels on strategic forces on both sides, which they had not done before, and to cut their forces by 50% down to equal levels. It was a breakthrough that would have made uh, Reykjavik an important summit regardless of anything else that happened. The next morning in the bubble, I reported to the president that we had accomplished more in that night at the Hofti House uh, than we had over seven years of negotiations with the Soviets before. Here is Akramayev, kind of as a funny expression with both looking warily at each other on that. This is Sunday afternoon. The summit was supposed to end at uh, noon on Sunday. They decided to go into overtime. And basically it was both could agree on deep reductions of nuclear weapons, both could not agree on SDI. Reagan wanted SDI unfettered. Gorbachev wanted SDI research confined to the laboratories and in essence killed in that way. We revised our proposal on that. Here's Paul Nitze having a hard time staying awake because he had done a all-nighter yeah. and at the age of 70. I had never done an all-nighter before. I had miss, missed this college tradition <laughs> for some reason. Uh, I was uh, 40 at that time and s dragging. Uh, here's Don Regan, the President, Schultz, and, um, and uh, Poindexter right there. He's looking over our last uh, proposal. Reagan, while the proposal was being discussed and all, Reagan kept saying, you know, I promised Nancy I would be home for dinner. <laughs> and he felt terrible that he had to miss that, you know, dinner with Nancy. I said at one point, I said, Mr. President, she's going to know where you are. Uh, it's not like you're up to no good. Uh, and he said, I know, but I told her I'd be home Sunday night for dinner. And therefore, he declared that come what may, this was going to be his last offer to Gorbachev. He was going to leave after that. When he stood up and we had our last offer that he's reading over right then, he left the room. And we all said, good luck, Mr. President. We knew it was a big moment in history, in his life, in our lives, and in history. Uh, then we were all kind of standing there, looking at each other, dramatic moment. And within th 20 seconds, back comes Ronald Reagan into the room. So he didn't even have time to go down. This was on the second floor. He didn't have time to go down to the first floor. And we're wondering, what was that? He walks in. And he has all of us in a circle right here. And he says, now I just want to make sure, are we doing right by America? Is, this, is everybody secure on this proposal? And then he kind of does a roll call. Uh, Don, what do you think? Uh, George, what do you think? You know, Ken, what do you think? He goes around holding everybody kind of responsible for their views and just making sure that the summit madness, the negotiation madness, uh, doesn't get people carried away. And for 27 years since Reykjavik, I thought to myself, what a wonderful thing to, for a leader to have done, saying, let's pause and reflect at a moment like this. And I couldn't understand 
why he I did that so much, although it was a wonderful thing. And then I went back on the 10th anniversary of Reykjavik, and I realized when you go outside our parlor on the right is a window before you go down the stairs. And he must have looked out that window, seen the 3,217 accredited journalists on the lawn of the Hofti House, and thought, this is a big moment, and we better get it right on this, and turned around and went back on that. It was a uh, fantastic, fantastic moment to me, uh, and a real lesson in leadership. Uh, he made an offer, Gorbachev refused the offer, Gorbachev wanted to kill SDI, Ronald Reagan didn't want to touch SDI, he didn't confine it anymore. He, they leave the Hofti House. Uh, according to one account, Gorbachev says to him right here, well, I don't know what we could have done differently. And Reagan, right after his picture is taken, puts his hand in Gorbachev's chest and says, well, you could have said yes. And then uh, goes into his car. I don't know, they're two different, and you'll see them in the book, variations on how the thing ended. I do know this. And we went back to the ambassador's house. Reagan was so mad he couldn't sit down. He couldn't talk to anybody. Jim Kuhn, who is his, you know, body man right there, um, <coughs> said that he, he was with Reagan for eight years. He said he never saw the president so emotionally disturbed except when Nancy was going in for her cancer surgery. And he was just fit to be tied. And he was really mad about uh, Gorbachev's obstinacy. Gorbachev was mad at Reagan's obstinacy. And it was a low point of their relationship. Uh, Reagan stayed mad all the way out to Keflavik, which is the military base uh, at the airport. And um, once he, he was supposed to, scheduled for a three minute hello to the troops before flying off on that. And once he got in front of the, here's no deal, Time Magazine the next, the next uh, day, <clears throat> Reagan really mad getting into his car and uh, Gorbachev right there. Uh, right once he gets before the troops, the American troops, uh, there he lights up and he becomes Ronald Reagan once again. He just loved the troops. He told a story that was all too long. He was supposed to be there for three minutes, five minutes at the most. He told a story all too long about <clears throat> when he was, first became president. He knew from his time in uh, the army uh, during the war that uh, unless you're in uniform, you really can't salute. So a few months after he became president, he was over at the Marine Commandant's house and quarters, and he said to the Commandant, you know, I understand the rules that you can't salute unless you're in uniform, but there is no uniform for a Commander-in-Chief. And I'm just wondering if there could be a regulation or something that would allow me to salute. And as he told this story, he said the Commandant of the Marine Corps said something very, very smart. He said, Mr. President, if you saluted, I don't think anybody would mind. And so after that time, uh, just kind of whenever he could, uh, Ronald Reagan would salute. And, uh, you know, uh, he loved, loved to salute on that. Uh, funniest thing, this is, I just put it in the presentation, this is a letter that uh, Reagan wrote me a few weeks after. Uh, I put this in because I spent a long time getting every document from Reykjavik. I spent a long time getting the, the Reagan Library documents. I spent a long time in Washington getting the documents. My wife and I just moved, and in one of my files about 10 days ago, I find a letter from Reagan to me about Reykjavik that had, I found, and it's not in the book. So the most personal, the most direct document of all was in my, some file that I just filed away at that time, and I have all these far-flung documents that I have peripheral uh, use with, uh, or connection with Reykjavik, and the one that concerns me, uh, maybe at a later, <coughs> later version of the book on there. General Secretary Gorbachev. This is the next year, if and Rick Burt is on the podium. I'll you show you him right here. For the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, June of If you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. There's Rick, right there.
Mr. Gorbachev. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. A great moment. Rick, you want to tell us about that for two minutes? No, no, this is your show. I know what. Tell us for two minutes. You're right here. We got a man of history. Stand up. Well, Go on. I'll, I'll give you one little anecdote. Yeah, please do. The morning before President Reagan gave that speech. Just a sec, Rick, if you don't mind, I'm just wait for the mic. Yeah. Thank you, Rick, for this. Couldn't help but do it. Caught us off guard. No, no, he's right here. The, uh, the morning before. Uh, President Reagan gave that speech, and he had arrived in Berlin, I got an urgent call from the mayor of Berlin, who's a man named Eberhard uh, Diepken. And he said, I need to come over and see you prior to the president's speech before the Brandenburg Gate. Rick was the ambassador, or, uh, ambassador to West Germany at that time. And uh, the mayor showed up, and he, his title in those days was Governing Mayor of Berlin because Berlin was not formally part of the Federal Republic of, of Germany. It had this special status, and, it, and legally and formally, it was an occupied city, still, even in 1987. And he came to see me and said that he had been given a courtesy copy of the President's speech, and he wanted something deleted from the speech. Mm -hmm. And I said, what? And he said, well, this sentence, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. <laughs> and I said, Mr. Mayor, how in the world could we delete that language? And he said, well, I'm afraid that, you know, uh, it would be, be uh, uh, provocative. It could make the uh, East Germans and the Russians unhappy. There might be demonstrations. And, uh, and we, we don't want to create that uh, during the president's visit. And I, all I could do is kind of, I was, I was flabbergasted. And all I could do is say, Mr. Governing Mayor, you don't know Ronald Reagan. <laughs> he has to say that. And uh, gov Governing Mayor left. And I, I uh, read about three weeks later an interview that the Governing Mayor gave to the Berlin media saying how proud he was that the American <laughs> president could come to Berlin and ask Mr. Gorbachev to tear down the wall. <laughs> Did he claim that he had put that uh, sentence in the speech? No, he didn't make that claim, but nearly everybody else has. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. That was great. I appreciate that. <laughs> There's a wonderful part in the book about how that came about, and uh, it seemed like Ronald Reagan was just about the only one who really wanted that uh, to be in there. The White House, uh, the rest of the White House was kind of against it. Uh, Ken Duberstein rode in the limo out to the speech with Reagan, raised the issue once more. And Reagan was kind of looking out the window and kind of, you know, daydreaming. And Duberstein raised the issue. It had been a four-month, three-month taffy tug in Washington uh, with the State Department firmly opposed and most of the White House opposed, except the speechwriters group. And Duberstein again raised the issue, and Reagan kind of looks out the window, and then he looks at Ken and he says, well, I think it's the right thing to do. And then he goes on. The most objectionable part of the speech was not just the tear down the wall, but making it personal. Mr. Gorbachev. And that draft after draft was with the name, without the name, they, you know, and all that. If you notice when he delivers it, he repeats the name twice in case anybody missed that. So uh, it's kind of, you know, that uh, you don't like the name, here it is, and it's twice. Uh, this is at the 87th summit. You can see how the first ladies are warm and tender towards each other. Uh, <laughs> just so, so affectionate. Uh, they had, uh, by this time, they were barely tolerating each other. Uh, this was the summit that uh, signed the INF uh, Treaty. And this is uh, in the East Room of the White House. Here's Secretary Schultz. Here's Vice President Bush. Here's uh, Chevronazzi. And here's Mrs. Gorbachev and Mrs. Reagan. Uh, here's Akra Mayoff, who I told you about, Dobrynin right there. This is mostly uh, KGB and uh, Secret Service, who kind of, you know, were <laughs> interspersed together in a wonderful cooperative manner. Uh, this is uh, the, our arms team. This is Colin Powell. There's Paul Nitsa, myself, 
Max Campbellman, and then I'm horrified to see in this the uh, chairman uh, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff sitting behind us, of all things, on that. Uh, <coughs> it, this is a happy moment in the relationship of the two of them while they're signing this uh, agreement. Six months later, Reagan is in Moscow, and he is amazing at Moscow, and you'll see that in the book. It is, according to diplomatic procedures, kind of bad form to be criticizing the country you're visiting, okay? When Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger went to China, at the time, if not the height of the Cultural Revolution, which was the epitome of Mao's absolute insanity, Mao responsible for, what is it, 35 million deaths, okay? But the uh, Cultural Revolution, absolutely one of the most barbaric things of modern time, in their talks with Mao, they never mention what's going on all over the city. Here is Ronald Reagan going from place to place to place over four days, talking about the value of freedom, talking how the Soviets should have Solzhenitsyn come back, they should publish all these things. The spokesman each night says, I don't know why this is going on. They try to send a signal, and no signal works with Ronald Reagan. And it's an amazing account of him being like an old prophet uh, from the te Old Testament prophet, uh, going around and giving the gospel according to Heydrich, according to uh, Ayn Rand, according to Milton Friedman. This is the last night they're there. They have a state dinner. This is a four-day summit, uh, meetings, uh, lots of meetings, Reagan running around town like crazy. Uh, that night they do a state dinner, and then they do the Bolshoi Ballet, and then they take a stroll in Red Square. Uh, a member of the press says, Mr. President, after all this exhausting time, here's a guy 77 years old at that time, uh, you know, why did you come here this night after a state dinner in the ballet? He says, because we're leaving tomorrow morning and I didn't want to leave town without Nancy seeing this site. So they are there and I, it's a beautiful photo. This is um, in October of 1989. This is uh, Honecker from East Germany. This is for the 40th anniversary, the most uncelebrated anniversary in history. And uh, Gorbachev, Honecker is welcoming Gorbachev in what I consider a little bit more passionate than a uh, manual of comradely brother and kisses need to be on this. Uh, he kisses him here and he kisses him off very shortly because uh, Honecker, what was it, two months later, uh, the <coughs> wall fell and Honecker is out of office. In fact, Honecker is out of office before the wall fell. This is a wonderful thing that uh, picture Rostopovich. Um, he hears about the wall falling on November 8th, 19, November 9th, November 9th, uh, 1989. He is in Europe. He jumps on a plane with his cello and he goes to the wall unannounced, basically, and he says, all I need is a chair. And someone produces that chair right there, and he sits with his back to the wall for an hour and a half, expressing his emotion through the uh, Bach uh, <coughs> suites for unaccompanied uh, cello. And the next month, and his last year of life, uh, Leonard Bernstein goes to Berlin and does uh, Beethoven's Ode to Joy and with an orchestra made up of East Germans, West Germans, um, Americans, French, British, and Russians. Were you at that concert, Rick, or not? Okay. And it was just great. He finished the concert, the church bells rang, and the whole city uh, erupted on that. Then two years later was the fall of the Soviet Union. This is beautiful. On a flight to Detroit, Stu Spencer says, why are you doing this, Ron? Why do you want to be president? Without a minute's hesitation, Reagan blurts out, to end the Cold War. Before that, 1970s, Reagan envisioned how it would end. We win, they lose. And on Christmas Day, 91, the flag of the Soviet Union was lowered. Ending the Cold War, we won, and they lost. In 94, Reagan writes November a letter 5th, to the American people. 1994. My fellow Americans, I have recently been told that I am one of the millions of Americans who will be afflicted with Alzheimer's disease. 
Unfortunately, as Alzheimer's disease progresses, the family often bears a heavy burden. I only wish there was some way I could spare Nancy from this painful experience. When the time comes, I am confident that with your help, she will face it with faith and courage. In closing, let me thank you, the American people, for giving me the great honor of allowing me to serve as your president. When the Lord calls me home, whenever that may be, I will leave the greatest love for this country of ours and eternal optimism for its future. I now begin the journey that will lead me into the sunset of my life. I know that for America, there will always be a bright dawn ahead. Thank you, my friends. Sincerely, Ronald Reagan. That was in 94. In 96, the uh, Iceland government asked uh, the participants to come back, and I did. And uh, I retraced our steps from 10 years at, before, and I felt an onrush of emotion that uh, I really have never experienced before and couldn't understand. Uh, when I went into the bubble, when I went into the ambassador's residence, when I went into our parlor where we were on Sunday afternoon, when we went into the conference area with Akra Mayoff and the all-night session, and uh, I was just swept away, to tell you the truth. And I walked into town from the Hofty House, and I bought a postcard just like this, and uh, I knew that Reagan was in Al was, had Alzheimer's disease then, and uh, I didn't have their address. And I just said, President Ronald Reagan, Reagan Presidential Library, Simi Valley, California. I didn't have any other address. And I said, you know, something like, Mr. President, I'm here on the 10th anniversary, just remembering the wonderful job you did 10 years ago and how very proud I was to serve you. I mailed that postcard. <clears throat> Two weeks later, I was out at the Reagan Library. I saw Mrs. Reagan at that. And I told her, she asked me about Reykjavik. I said, rather than tell you about the conference, let me just tell you about the postcard I sent. She looked at me like, didn't you get, don't you understand? And my husband can't read anything now. And, but she did say, well, what did you say? And I told her how very proud I was. And she broke down and cried. One of the sad parts I have about this book is that I asked the uh, people at the Reagan Library to go through mounds of letters to try to find the postcards, and they were heroic in trying. They didn't save that much material after the presidency, especially after he got Alzheimer's, and it was a postcard. But I was hoping that I could have that for the book, but um, I, I couldn't. But I remember distinctly what it said, and I remember <clears throat> that was uh, the postcard on that. Uh, just a few years later, and uh, now next in two weeks, uh, 10 years ago, uh, June 5th, 1904, no, uh, Ronald Reagan left the darkness and entered you know, the uh, total darkness of uh, passing. There was an outpouring of emotion around the country for uh, the fallen leader. This, as the funeral procession is going down the highway, I love this, two firefighters uh, honor the president <coughs> with the flag right there. This, when the motorcade in California is going beneath the viaduct, they're standing at attention, people are putting their hands over their hearts. This, <coughs> right before the, the flag has been folded, the family is saying goodbye to the casket before it is lowered. And <coughs> we were, Carol and I, we're in, really honored to be at the uh, cathedral, the National Cathedral for the funeral there. But to me, the most poignant thing happened the day before the funeral. Day before the funeral, unannounced and unanticipated, Mikhail Gorbachev flies in to what is now called the Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport. He goes right over to the Capitol and the guards let him in there and then let him in uh, beyond the rope partition right there. He stands a few feet away from the coffin for a minute or so in thought. Then he approaches the coffin. He reaches out. 
he gives a pat, and then he slides his arm back and forth along the stripes of the flag of the 40th President of the United States. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing that Gorbachev did right there to honor his friend. And uh, it's kind of the last chapter in <coughs> the story of the Reykjavik Summit. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Ken. That was, uh, I imagine you have to practice quite a bit not to break down every time you go into the last several slides there. Um, well, it's I, a beautiful thing that uh, Gorbachev did. It's a beautiful thing. I love that, that um, letter that he wrote to the American people. There was my publisher and editor wanted to, because it's kind of hard to read, they wanted, you know, a typed out version of it. And I thought about that, and especially because electronic, and then I decided, no. There's something wonderful about a handwritten letter. There's something wonderful about the fact that he crossed out words and misspelled words. This was not a staff-driven thing. You, he just took a piece of paper and he wrote those beautiful, beautiful words. And uh, then I decided, and that's the only footnote in here, there's 375 endnotes about where I get all the material because it's very well documented. But the only footnote is saying that in the back, you can find a typed version if you find this hard to read. And I said, because some people do find this hard to read, but then I put a nice, if I may say so myself, a nice sentence after that. If you think it was hard to read, you should see how hard it was to write. Mm -hmm. And that uh, I think it's a beautiful thing that uh, what he did. Yeah. Well, let me actually ask you uh, on that theme of, uh, of sources and research. How much would you say of your of the overall arc of how you tell this story is something that if you could go back and talk to the Ken Edelman of 19, 1986 uh, would have made sense to him at that time? And how much of this is based on either events that have happened in the world, you know, the way that other people have told this story, and then the, the research that you did? That's a very good question, Matt. It's a great question. I didn't know very much, even though I was there, I knew about the bubble, I knew what the president told, I had no idea what was inside the room, okay? Now I know, and now you can know, because we have the notes, like I say, and uh, for 10 and a half hours, and they, by and large, 90% of the notes agree, the Russian and, and uh, American version, so I didn't know that. Secondly, I had no idea that the most sweeping arms control agreement in history was gonna be written and signed a year Later, I couldn't believe that. And thirdly, I had no idea, and everybody thought it was, you'd be out of your mind to think that the Soviet Union was going to go. And uh, one of the wonderful things about the research of this is to know that Ronald Reagan said in the 70s that, you know, that the Cold War was going to end. And on the plane, that's what I put on that slide, which I think is unbelievable, on the plane going to Detroit, for the convention in 1980, Stu Spencer says, Ron, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to be president? And he says, to end the Cold War. Now, if I were on that plane and I heard this guy say that in, what was that, July of 1980, I'd say, he's going to be president? He has no touch with reality. I mean, no one was talking about the end of the Cold War. We, when Rick was in government, when I was in government, Cold War was, you know, there forever. And it was going to be forever. And there was no end in sight. And Ronald Reagan says, oh yeah, it's going to be on the ash heap of history. Where does this come from? One of the th problems with writing a book is to figure out Ronald Reagan. And I say in there <coughs> that in the year 2004, I, Henry Kissinger was nice enough to invite me to lunch. And he started the lunch. We were on the policy board together, the Pentagon policy board together. And he started you know, talking about policy board material. And then uh, he started talking about leadership, like I was a one-man Harvard seminar or something <laughs> like that, and Talleyrand did this, and Bismarck this, and you know, and all this stuff. And you know, I was kind of paying attention to it, and kind of nice. And uh, then I said, yes, but how about Reagan? Reagan didn't have all this. And Kissinger was crestfallen. He was so crestfallen that I think for 20, 25 seconds he didn't say anything, <laughs> which means he was really crestfallen, okay? And he says, 
Ronald Reagan is sui generis. I can't figure him out. And no one really can figure out. He was very unreflective. He never wanted to talk about himself. And uh, so you have no idea. What you do know is what he did. What he did was amazing. And you do know that he had elements of foreign policy that were new. And whether he thought all that out or just stumbled in, like let me actually ask know. you on, on that point. You you did observe and you did comment <laughs> in, in this talk and you did write about in the book uh, unique, I would say, unique aspects of Reagan's interaction with his staff, uh, all the way from you know Schultz uh, on down. Uh, and I wonder if you were, uh, first of all, if you, if, if you could just sort of encapsulate, you know, what his, his style was of interacting. I mean, we, we all know in Washington, right, that uh, there are sort of two categories of people, right? There are the people who pull the levers of power and the people who actually know what direction the levers ought to be pulled and, <laughs> and, are, and whose job it is to advise on that. Uh, so, so one kind of, could you, is it the caricature that Reagan basically didn't listen to his staff, that he had this moral compass? And, and two, given your research now, and particularly reading the notes and so on, do you have a sense of how that contrasted with Gorbachev, the younger man, new to power, surrounded by people like the five-star marshal? Mm -hmm. At times when Reagan wasn't very interested in the subject, he would, you know, read his notes, and uh, at times, you know, was just uh, didn't care that much about it. There was a story that he asked King Hussein of Jordan, how was the fishing in the Dead Sea at one point? And uh, uh, King Hussein said the fishing wasn't very good that, that season at all. And, uh, you know, there was all kinds of, uh, you know, things. I walked into the Oval Office one time with Bill Clark, and uh, they said, Mr. President, and Reagan was kind of looking out the window, and they said, Mr. President, Ken's here, and there's a meeting in the Situation Room on arms control. And Reagan kept looking out the window. And uh, they said, Mr. President, he says, I hear you, Bill, I hear you. He says, God, look at that. And so we look out the window, and there's all kinds of kind of forest rangers or whoever takes care of the lawn out there, clipping and doing all their things on the lawn. And Reagan says, you know, geez, I just wish I was out there doing what those guys are doing instead of going to all these stupid meetings I have to go to. Now, I thought to myself, a lot of guys who are out there taking care of the lawn want to be president, but I don't know many people who are president who want to be out there taking care of the lawn. So when he didn't care, he didn't care, okay? Uh, otherwise, he just knew what he was going to do. And what surprised me, looking at these notes, was that in 10 and a half hours, that he doesn't turn to Schultz and say, what do you think? Gorbachev doesn't turn to Shevardnadze and mm -hmm. say, what do you think? I say in the beginning of that, for all their exalted titles, Secretary of State, Foreign Minister of the Soviet Union, Chief of Staff of the White House, National Security Advisor Poindexter, they didn't play much of a role in Reykjavik. And unlike other memoirs where, you know, uh, the tone of many other memoirs is, uh, look at how great a man I am and what people, other people react to a great man throughout my life. Um, I could wish to tell you I was a key player in a historical <laughs> event. I wasn't. I was a player in a key historical event. And Reagan didn't have much, and he didn't need much, and he didn't want much on this. He did go back to make sure that each of us were comfortable on our position on that, and so that was right. Uh, but otherwise, he was flying solo, and that's what's beautiful about this story. You see the real Ronald Reagan. You can't read chapters 4, 5, and 6, the back and forth with him and Gorbachev, and not be awfully impressed on how well he does. Uh, let me, uh, you're someone who has uh, not only experience from this instance uh, in which it played a central role in this story, but more broadly on the question of SDI and, and missile defense more generally. This remains absolutely central to the tension between Moscow and Washington on arms control more broadly. I mean, there's no question about that. I think Putin has made it enormously clear. Uh, and we really have still no resolution. We are at an impasse. That I, I, when I looked at that cartoon, I realized you know, that, that same cartoon just changed the, the figures, and it could be funny today or tragic. Uh, why? Why is this so vitally important in opposite directions for both sides? Still. Because the Russians cannot compete in high tech like the United States, because the Russians 
power in the world is reliant on their military power, and if you have a missile defense, you're diminishing, if not, I don't think <coughs> you're abrogating the power, but you're certainly diminishing that kind of power, and the Russians aren't very good at changing their doctrine at all, and they're not very adept at changing doctrine, and so that they don't like anything this new. Uh, I think the intellectual argument against strategic defense is a very hard argument to make. I don't know what's so great about building more and more missiles to obliterate more and more innocent people on the other side and not having some kind of defense for your own country. I think what a president has <clears throat> a situation where you are threatened with an incoming ballistic missile. Right now you have two choices. You can do nothing and say it was just a dirty shame which is, you know, uh, absolutely almost uh, untenable if uh, it's something a, a ballistic missile wipes out an American city. Last act almost, of president, almost certainly. Oh, my God, it's just an awful, awful thing. Or you can retaliate against a country, which you may not know what country did it nowadays, unlike at Reagan's day, because you could have a nth country or uh, uh, <coughs> from a mysterious place. And, uh, or you just wipe out, even if you knew the destination, the address of that, to wipe out a bunch of innocent people because their government uh, lobbed a uh, ballistic missile towards you, seems to me not only stupid, but immoral in a large sense. So isn't it wonderful to have an option C, where you can shoot down something come in? So I don't see the intellectual argument against it. And in fact, I put in this, that uh, the year before the Reagan administration, I said, that what we should do is pursue kind of a research on uh, ballistic missile defense. And uh, I was talking, admittedly, very different from Reagan. I was talking about bolstering traditional deterrence. But Reagan was talking about ending deterrence and, and really protecting the country from incoming ballistic missiles. And the, the story of <clears throat> when he came to this revelation is a very interesting story. He was getting ready. Uh, to run for president. It was 1979. He went to NORAD outside of, um, of Colorado Springs and uh, the Northern Command with the United States Canadian Defense Command and he got a tour of NORAD and then you know, NORAD's in the middle of the, che the Cheyenne Mountain right there. The door is something like five feet wide and all that to protect it from a nuclear blast. And they have a conference room there with a gigantic screen of, uh, you know, for, to indicate any incoming ballistic missiles. And everybody goes and they're, they're wowed by the technology. They're wowed by the whole uh, being inside the mountain and all that kind of stuff. It's a Dr. Strangelove moment for everybody there. And um, while, you know, everybody else says, boy, this is just so impressive, Ronald Reagan kind of left uh, very disturbed. And he says to the commander, Jim Hill at the time, he says, uh, so what happens if this board lights up? And the commander, <coughs> general, says, oh, you see these phones? We pick these up and we get immediately the Situation Room of the White House. See these phones? We get commands from around the world. You see these phones? We get commands from uh, across the United States. And Reagan says, okay, so what do they do? Well, they call the other people and, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, without too fine a point on it, uh, everybody's calling everybody saying, holy cow, you know. <laughs> and Reagan says, well, shouldn't we do something about it besides calling everybody? And after that time, he says, let's do something. It took him about three years of thinking about it, of working with the Joint Chiefs on that, to think that there was a possibility that there could be strategic defense. Now, Ronald, SDI, as I say in the book, never worked as Ronald Reagan thought it would work. It worked much better. Ronald Reagan thought it would protect the United States against Soviet ballistic missiles. It ended up protecting the United States against the Soviet Union. Because from that, at Reykjavik, Ron, Mikhail Gorbachev has basically two approaches. One is to make Reagan a deal on SDI that Reagan can't refuse. And to his horror and dismay, Gorbachev finds out that there's no deal that Ronald Reagan can't refuse when it comes to SDI. So then the alternative is to try to compete in the technology area so that he can have something like SDI. And we know that from the, you saw that from the record, that the Soviets, you know, the preparation for Reykjavik, they talk about something like that. And now we have those records open to us, and I, I refer to them right there. 
Gorbachev accelerates his reforms right after Reykjavik, within weeks. He calls the uh, committee, the Central Committee, uh, has sweeping reforms. The reforms are all bollocked up, all confusing, and probably wouldn't have succeeded in any case, but certainly Gorbachev leaves no doubt about success because they were bound to fail the way he did them. They're just a conglomeration of uh, half ideas that keep changing constantly. On the perestroika, economic side, on the glasnost side, to open up the closed pages of our past, as Gorbachev said, they work marvelously. They work much to his detriment. When you open up the closed pages of the Soviet past, it is an ugly picture of what Stalin did and uh, the Soviet uh, governments. Last question from me, and then I think we should take a few from the audience. Um, so I learned at least three lessons uh, from what you have created here. Uh, one is, of course, never underestimate Ronald Reagan. Second is don't go stag to a party with Reza Gorbachev. Uh, <laughs> and third is definitely don't play Ken Edelman in a British TV series. Uh, but I wonder if you could uh, shed light on probably the most urgent lesson at this moment, and that is what from Reagan's unique style of leadership, from the interaction at the highest levels between Washington and Moscow that you have witnessed, can we learn and apply today in dealing with a crisis that I would argue in a quarter of a century is more similar to the Cold War than anything else we have seen? And I, and I include in that that I think we are coming close to the nuclear threshold. Ukraine is an issue unlike any other for the Russians. I think there are two things. Number one is that Reagan had, whether conscious or not, a strategy on how to approach it. And he continued with that strategy. He had elements that related to his overall strategy. His strategy was to end the Cold War, we win, they lose. But how do you do that? Okay, you need some way to do that. He had four elements that were critical. Deep reductions in nuclear weapons, overall military buildup, a SDI that was not on the works for anybody before him, and a delegitimization of the Soviet Union. To start off talking about the evil empire, to start off his first press conference as president says they lie, cheat, and steal to further their aim to advance communism around the world. The next year he goes into the evil empire. The next year he says it's going to end up on the ash heap of history. The next year he talks about that it's the center of evil, the focus of evil in the modern world. And his last address to the nation before leaving the White House, 10 days before he leaves the White House, he says you have to be careful when dealing with these communists, okay? So it's a consistent delegitimization. So having a strategy and going at it in a consistent way is something I don't feel today. And number two is courage. Ronald Reagan had enormous moral courage. And he had these innovations of foreign policy. And in 1984, when he was running for re-election, everybody thought his foreign policy was kind of bonzo, that it was very provocative, it was very uh, kind of uh, dangerous for this world, and that, um, you know, that uh, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and all kinds of commentators at that time said it hasn't produced anything. And you know what I say in the book, it's absolutely right. If Reagan had been a one-term president, like his predecessor and like his successor, both, uh, he would have been a bust in foreign policy. That it didn't seem like from all this tension and all this high wire act, much of it was produced at all. But then, as things played out, especially at Reykjavik, it really was a magnificent foreign policy. And if Ronald Reagan is known for anything in history, it's ending the Cold War. And if anything I try to do in this book is not try to do, but present evidence, not arguments, but just evidence that uh, he did it. Thank you very much, Ken. We have microphones on both sides here. Uh, sir, right here in the front? Yes. So just uh, name, institution, and, and your question. Eric McVeigh, the Institute for Foreign Policy Analysis. I'm a retired Navy Rear Admiral. I was the commander of the Iceland Defense Force oh, at wow. the time of the summit. You have a picture of me there. Oh, really? Uh, uh, in your slides. Uh, with Reagan? Yes. When I was, uh, I had just introduced him at the, at the base. Oh, my at God. Um, Should we go back? Got, yeah, I want to see this. Well, while you're doing okay. that, let me mention that. Um, I want to see this. President Vigdis Finnbogado Theater and uh, uh, Prime Minister Stan Goodman Hermanson told me afterwards that 
uh, President Reagan had shown up at Bessestather, which is the president's right. residence, and he didn't have a coat. Mm -hmm. And they let him borrow that coat. I don't know what. Oh, origin. really? So it was a borrowed coat from the Icelanders. Is that right? Well, that clarifies one of the mysteries. That See that? Thank you you asked what I know now and I didn't know before. That's the coat right there. Uh huh. And of course, that's Hubby House. That's why I never saw it. Yes, that's before right. Before or after? Yes. Isn't this great? <laughs> we have to rush into a second edition right, right now, right. Uh, <laughs> explaining the coat. I can put my letter in, and it's a ways if you're looking for the picture of me. But uh, I am. I am. We want to give you your due. Well, uh, while you're doing that, let me mention that out at the base, I was concerned. Of course, uh, the arrival of President Reagan was greatly delayed, as you've mentioned. He kept sending me messages all day. Hold on. There I am right there. Uh, uh, then, good looking guy? T tis I then, uh, some years ago. I was That's very concerned great. because I was afraid that he would become confused or something on arms control substantive issues, and I just introduced him to the world and <laughs> all of that stuff. Um, his speech, well, that's exciting. I'm sorry? That's exciting to have you here. His speech, uh, as I saw when I greeted him and so forth, had all sorts of crossed out words and interlineations and so forth. What I'm telling you is the speech he delivered there at Keblevik uh, was uh, tailored significantly by him. I kept thinking he was going to get lost in it and something awful was going to, and embarrassing was going to happen. But as you know, that wasn't the case at all. And uh, anyway, it was a, a quite He told a the story about saluting, and then he told the story, this crazy story about uh, the congressman and uh, that he had to get back to Washington because the congressman wanted to lower military pay. And it reminded him of another story of them being in a convertible and uh, with the rain. And then it led to another story. And he, he was supposed to talk for, you know, three or yes. four minutes. Now, you guys were there, as I understand, for seven hours waiting That's for right. him. Okay. And by the way, the people stayed. And when he came in uh, to the hangar, we had all been told by the Secret Service that we had to be on the, uh, the stage there. And uh, this little band that I had there for my change of command, I had just become the commander of the ISIS Defense Force two or three days before. Uh, so this was your first event? Well, first big event, It's yes. called starting out with a bang. Yes. <laughs> um, and the band struck up Hail to the Chief, and I saw him light up, and I think you're right. That rejuvenated him oh, with yeah. all of the fatigue. But yeah. I'm taking too much time. I enjoyed no, your that talk. that was great. Thanks. Well, thank you for your service. Historic, that really was wonderful. Historic gathering. Yeah, it's a historic gathering. Yeah. You, get a, you get a picture with you, you, you Rick, and the general. I but like. you should have retired right after that. I mean, you know, it doesn't get any better, you know, especially you're at Reykjavik. What else is going to happen, well, you know? Well, I went to Beijing after my tour in Iceland as a defense attache. Oh, that's pretty and good. it was a year after Tiananmen, so the excitement in my career did not end. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, right back there in the yeah. corner. That's exciting. Hi, uh, Steve Luckett. I study IR here in the city and, and work uh, in media likewise. Uh, a number of my mentors in television, uh, Shelley Fieldman, Percy Arrington, uh, Brokaw, told me that, uh, and, can, and keep telling me, um, that uh, covering Reagan was like really one of the more exciting uh, tasks that anyone uh, in journalism could want. I mean, the trips, uh, the, uh, the insight by a number of his aides. I think uh, from a number of the shots I saw, Pete Souza did some of the snaps, so I mean the, the optics were fantastic. So if, if you'll uh, indulge my producer's instincts, I'll try and just sort of rifle through my questions. Could you give us a survey of Reagan uh, on stage? Uh, there, to take um, Coates for 400, there's another story about Reagan uh, sort of shrugging off a coat to sort of give the appearance of being, you know, a few years after a gunshot, hardy, hale, sort of indomitable leader, you know. Uh, so if you could take a survey of that. Another piece is that um, the COG exercises and, um, and being around uh, an officer with a football uh, was uh, pretty um, telling for Reagan, but one of the things they say really got to him was the day after. So could you take a, take a survey of that also? Um, to the point of, um, of the Russians, and I suppose this is where my sort of policy appetite really kicks in, could you take a, a survey of whether or not the uh, launches, I guess, 
from as far back as last June along Kamchatka for a violation of the 87 protocol. Uh, and thanks again. I appreciate it. Great. All right. All right. Uh, <laughs> I, I leave it to you to compact that into a reasonable answer. Let me take the middle of your questions because one of the frightful and to me the most chilling scenes I had from Reykjavik, and I put this in the book, was the two officers holding the briefcase with the nuclear codes in that small house at the Hofti House, within feet of each other, standing there all day long without looking at each other during that time and knowing that uh, they were just that close and knowing that inside the room the two leaders were talking about that. That was a very chilling and moment. I kept looking at them every time we walked into the Hofti house and we left the two of them into that room, the officers in the hallway. And I put in the book that that was the most chilling and even distinct memory I had from the weekend uh, in Iceland. In terms of presentation, um, you know, Mike Deaver, who Rick and I worked with, uh, was known as the vicar of visuals and uh, really always had Reagan in a, a good light. But the fact is that Mike Deaver only was in the first term and the visuals continued through the second term just fine, thank you. He had a natural way of going and he had a naturalness about him. He said this, the camera never lies. He is, I think, and I should have put this in the book. I'm always thinking of these things I should put in the book, uh, including on the coat and everything. But uh, he was one of the few people from Hollywood who, well, number one, never changed his name. You know, he was born Ronald Reagan, stayed Ronald Reagan. Number two, never wore makeup at all. And number three, never played a bad guy. He didn't want to be a bad guy. And so uh, that's, you know, all three are pretty unique. There was a naturalness about him. And there was kind of a wonderful, I don't know, sense of drama. Maybe the president of Iceland, who only the admiral here can pronounce her name besides her husband, I think. But, um, you know, had it right. The theater I is. He was unmarried. Oh, he was unmarried. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> he says with a big smile. Uh, but uh, that. Um, that uh, maybe theater is the good way because he, he knew how to present himself. There's a wonderful story about FDR, <clears throat> another one who was just like Ronald Reagan and knowing how to present himself. In 19, I think it was 42 or 40, you know, probably uh, 41, uh, he invited, he heard that Orson Welles was in town. And so FDR said, get him over here for lunch. I want to have him for lunch. So uh, Orson Welles walked into the uh, president's office and uh, FDR is there uh, with his arm out, says, I just wanted to meet the other great um, actor in America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People said that Ronald Reagan was just an actor. Um, and uh, the fact is, he wasn't all that great of an actor, if you see a lot of his movies. But uh, he just knew how to present himself. And he had a touch of the dr drama about him when uh, we first when I first got appointed arms control director, uh, I went into the Oval Office, my swearing in actually, and I had my two little daughters with us, and uh, five and seven, I think they were then, or maybe six and eight, something like that. And um, so they were real cute, and Reagan lit up, and then he took them into the Oval Office and gave them uh, <laughs> jelly beans and all that kind of stuff, and showed them around and all that. And then when I left office, uh, seven years later, uh, we went back to say goodbye, and Carol brought the picture of the two girls with the president. And Reagan just took this picture. He looks at the girls, he looks at the picture, he looks at the girls, he looks at the picture, and he says, where did those little girls go to? <laughs> no, that's not scripted. That's not written out. You know, you're gonna, Carol's gonna appear with a picture of the girls, you know, from seven years before. He just had that kind of flair about him that uh, it's just beautiful to watch. We had one right there, sir. Uh, hi, Dave Ottaway uh, from the Woodrow Wilson Center. But it used to be Is that the, the Dave Ottaway from Angola days? That's right. Oh, my uh, God. Hi, Dave. But, uh, hi. I was at Reykjavik, uh, old and yeah. I was on the plane. We left a little earlier because Schultz had to go to and brief the Allies and what had happened. That's right. And I was really surprised about your comments that everybody agreed to the proposal from the American team because my memory on the plane was that 
my God, what do we do? He's given away the store. Or, and the people around Schultz, anyway, were really worried about how to explain this to the Allies. And it, so I'm really surprised you're saying that Schultz and everybody around him had agreed to that proposal because that, one, that those weren't the vibes we got on the plane. Well, you were on the plane going to Geneva. Going with Schultz after Reykjavik. Right, to, G to, to so Geneva. It was in Reykjavik, and then we went on. I can't remember where we went. Yeah, yeah. to brief the NATO. I was on the plane with the uh, journalists doing the background on that. There are various parts of this, Dave. And Dave was a wonderful, wonderful reporter at the Washington Post. And I think I wrote articles on Angola for you or something like that <laughs> uh, long ago. But anyway, uh, there was the INF idea that Gorbachev had a breakthrough on Sunday morning that we were going to have zero missiles in Europe and 100 in Asia. The 100 in Asia were dropped uh, a few months uh, after that time. And then you had the two leaders talking about doing away with nuclear weapons altogether. Okay? This was a, an exciting moment in uh, the Reykjavik, but it was not part of the actual, you know, negotiations in any sense and didn't last any longer than that weekend at Reykjavik, although it triggered an enormous uh, approach of trying to do away with nuclear weapons. And people <clears throat> like George Schultz, people like Rick Burke, people like Paul Nitze, people like Jack Matlock, you know, lots of people followed Ronald Reagan into zero nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear free world. Uh, after that time. And the Global Zero was one of them and, you know, lots of movements in that. In fact, Sam Nunn read this book and said very, very, very nice things about it. He was the one who contacted Michael Douglas to call me. And he said that the moment when they're talking about doing away with nuclear weapons was the main moment that he thinks stood out on this. On the doing away with all nuclear weapons, the world wasn't ready for that at that time. And that was questionable to lots of people. On the INF, the Intermediate Nuclear Force, the Euro missiles, that was a different story. Since 1977, the NATO allies had agreed on what's called the dual track decision, that we were going to zero out the SS-20s and we were going to zero out the American Pershing twos and ground long cruise missiles. Many of the Allies supported that position because they thought the Soviets would never buy onto it. Once the Soviets bought onto it at Reykjavik, they decided they didn't like it, okay? So you just can't have a position that Reagan announced in 1981 as the zero option. And when Gorbachev comes around and says, let's do it, we agree, you say, not so fast, Bo, all right? And it made the most sense, and it still makes the most sense of that. I think there was apprehension. I know that Maggie Thatcher, uh, Prime Minister Thatcher, in her memoirs, says, I supported the zero option because I didn't think it was going anywhere. Had I thought it was going somewhere, I wouldn't have supported it. Now, you know, that's difficult to deal at maybe the real world, but it's, it's kind of difficult. Ronald Reagan, who was a closet anti-nuclear guy that came springing out of the closet at Reykjavik, uh, to our surprise, at least my surprise, on this, uh, was uh, delighted with the zero option. So you may have been getting those vibes, Dave, on the INF side, or you might have been getting the vibes on the doing away with all nuclear weapons no, at all. all oh, yeah, yeah. Those, those vibes were way ahead of its time if, um, you know. And uh, Reagan felt that way, Gorbachev felt that way, but it didn't last any longer than that weekend. Yes, right there, sir. Well, one, thank you very much. It's most, uh, most interesting. I'm uh, doing some research on the public diplomacy during the I on the INF issue. Yeah. And I'm curious uh, on kind of the buildup toward Reykjavik, uh, how concerned were people about that effort might, not, might fail and whether or not anyone was thinking NATO might even crack over the public diplomacy effort on the zero zero. There's no one you can talk to who knows more about that than Rick Burt, okay? He was going back and forth. He went to Europe like I do, go to Bethesda, you know? And, uh, <laughs> so he, he knows that. 
All I know on the public diplomacy was at that time USIA was doing a big thing. I remember one time a guy came and came into my office says we really need a big splash on public diplomacy because the Italians which were one of the basin countries. What was it? Belgian, it was Germany and Italy and then the British, right? Yeah. And the Dutch, that's right. And some of them had P2s and some of them had the Glickham. Oh, only the Germans had the, the Pershings. Okay. And everybody else had the ground launch cruise missiles. But uh, someone came in the office, wee wee weeing, to me saying, oh my God, the latest poll coming out shows that 87% um, of Italians are against the deployment in Italy, something like that. Um, I said, well, where are the deployments? They're in Sicily, okay? So the S Sicily officials could handle that, uh, you know, in maybe not a democratic manner, but I mean, they could, they could uh, handle it themselves. And then, uh, thank God, for some reason, for some inspiration, I said, uh, I understand 87% are, uh, and therefore they need a lot of money to, uh, you know, to have a public diplomacy uh, assault on this. And I said, well, that's interesting. I said, how many people care about the deployment in Italy? Uh, well, I don't know. I said, why don't you go check and come back? Well, you know, they asked the Italian, list your top 25 priorities. And, you know, no one cared. No one cared. I said, well, let's not do a public diplomacy push, all right? We don't want to elevate the issue. No one really cares. When you ask them, they're opposed. But, you know, they, they never say they're opposed, they're never doing anything, and just let it be. And so we let it be and nothing really happened. The deployments went along. You had wonderful conglomeration of wonderful, wonderful leaders at that time. You had not only Ronald Reagan, you had Mikhail Gore, and, and, and you had Lady Thatcher, you had uh, Cole at that time, you had Mitterrand, who was good as can be uh, on that. Uh, you had a, an Italian government that changed every 10 days, I think, with uh, regularly. But uh, all of them, Andriotta came in and out about 14 times. And, uh, but all of them were, were pretty good. The Dutch, Lubbers was in the Dutch at one time, but uh, he was a little weak. But anyway, others were uh, pretty good on that. And so, um, you know, I think, I think the West did a wonderful, wonderful job on that. And it was uh, that kind of strength led I think, to the uh, zero option, to the signing of the INF agreement we saw on December 8th, 1987, with Reagan and Gorbachev, which we, I left government 10 days after Gorbachev left Washington. I left government thinking nothing could have been more important than my working on the real reduction of nuclear weapons in a way. I was wrong. The geostrategic realm that was happening because of what came out of Reykjavik was far more important than anything I had worked on. The whole idea of the reforms in the Soviet Union that would bring down the Soviet Union was way beyond anything I could imagine, any, anything most people could imagine except one person, and that was Ronald Reagan. It's amazing. Well, Ken, uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Great. I'm going to simply say that uh, leaning against the president's knees in the bubble may have been an awkward moment, but if some of his charisma rubbed off on you, I think we're the beneficiaries of it here. But it didn't. Oh, I think it did. <laughs> hey, will you, uh, will you autograph a couple of books for sure. the Kennan Institute? Sure. Great. Like that. Yeah.